everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Madeline Warren, and I'm the senior director here uh, in charge of our Southampton Gallery. And I'm so thrilled you all could join us. And also that we have Charles Gaines and Olga Viso here to talk a little bit about our exhibition and also what they have coming up. Um, Charles is, of course, a pivotal figure in conceptual art, and with this show, we're showing his uh, seminal Numbers and Trees series, which began with a walnut tree in 1977, and is uh, here featuring the Arizona Cottonwoods, which will lead into his show at the Phoenix Art Museum next year. Uh, so I'll uh, let Olga, who's chief curator of the museum there, talk a bit about how that show is unfolding um, and how maybe they'll be a bit bigger when they get to Arizona, right? <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll let you take it from here, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Madeline. Um, thank you, Charles, for... Um, being game uh, to do this conversation. It's a nice occasion to do it. Thank you, Mark, and the team here at House of Worth for the opportunity in Utah for the opportunity to do this. Because I think it's the idea was that we could talk a little bit about, well, obviously the new series here, the, the latest installment in Numbers and Trees um, that focuses on the Arizona Cottonwoods, but it's obviously related uh, to an exhibition that we have coming up in November of 2024 where we'll, we'll be showcasing um, the large set of Arizona trees, uh, Arizona trees, Numbers and Trees, uh, number one, this is series number two. Yes. And in addition um, uh, to presenting that entire series, and some of them are quite large scale um, triptychs um, in some cases, so a beautiful suite of galleries that um, will unveil the eight that are in this series, and there are 12 in this series if you've walked around the space. But we're gonna be presenting it in tandem with um, a retrospective that's in the works right now with the Institute of Contemporary Art in Miami that's curated by Jean Moreno that looks at the last 30 years of Charles's production from 1992 to 2022. And so I was telling Charles earlier, I'm so excited for us to be able to present uh, these two um, different approaches, two bodies of works, the two systems that he's worked with really his entire career to do them in tandem to be able to have a focus um, on, on the trees and uh, the mathematical um, systems uh, that really look at uh, the, the, this uh, indeterminate space that you mine between abstraction and representation and the subjective and the objective, um, but to then be able to look at it in tandem with his more language-based works that he's been making since the uh, early 1990s, um, where the political uh, content is more explicit uh, and to be able to, for you, that interplay of those works and those systems is really important. And we were saying it's not often talked about um, what, how important that interplay is, that uh, the uh, mathematical works, the grid-based works, um, are often talked about as a formal investigation uh, where the political content maybe isn't as front and center and that your more um, language-based works, uh, the political content is more explicit. But for you, it's, the political content is there uh, throughout. So to be able to highlight both, I think, is so important. And I, I just was curious um, to see if that resonated for you, that because that interplay is so important from, from the start and isn't talked about enough. I've heard you talk about it, um, about that important dynamic. Oh, it's working, right? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, um, the two bodies of work, one features mostly trees. Uh, Roxana, my wife, says too many trees. <laughs> and uh, the other body of work, which language-based works, to deal with uh, um, on, uh, sometimes the photographic object, but more often, and, and even in the case of the photographic object, it deals with you know, documents uh, that uh, are manifestations of, of political positions at uh, different times in history. And uh, so those two bodies of work, you know, actually the, the grid work started first, and in the late 80s, I went to the language-based work. And most often, uh, they're talked about in terms of uh, what seems to be the subject of the works. In the case of the language works, it's the political document. In the case of the grid work, it's the, the, the trees or faces of which whatever the object uh, is. 
and that's taken as a subject. And what, what is uh, often not talked about, which is the most important to me, is, the, is that each work uh, utilizes a system that manifests the subject. And I am more interested in that system. Uh, not that it's unrelated to the object that, that I'm dealing with. It's, it is related because it is through the system that the object becomes meaningful uh, or perceptible, but meaningful. Uh, uh, but uh, the, most of the discussions that I've had about it, uh, uh, the, the fact uh, that this is the most, that part is the most important to me, it's seen as an attempt on my part to sort of uh, not deal with the, the absolute politics of the work in an instrumental way. And so that if I'm talking about Dred Scott, then it means that I'm criticizing racism through the Dred Scott document. And certainly I'm criticizing racism, but it's not the instrumental use of the subject to me because, because if I was just criticizing racism by presenting Dred Scott, I wouldn't create this almost incomprehensible system to make that subject uh, uh, accessible. And uh, uh, so, because of that system, the system is almost not, it's almost as if the system complicates the ability to deal with what people perceive as a subject. And they don't know why I do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, the whole thing started with my son, actually, Malik Gaines, because I, I was giving a talk at the Hammer Museum, uh, and, uh, and so he got up and said, why are you dealing with this subject? Why are you creating this very complicated language system around it? And, uh, and, I, and I said, uh, why don't you just deal with the political subject? And I realized then that, that, that he was both missing something, but he was also right. That, uh, that in, in a way, there was something, there was a desire to deal with a, a more obvious uh, way of, of presenting this, the political subject. Uh, and at the same time, I didn't want the piece to be about that political subject. I wanted it to be about, you know, the, a system that helps that political subject come into being. And, uh, and at that point, I think he's right because I hadn't figured out how to deal with that yet. Those two aspects yet. The same thing I'm criticizing others for not being able to deal with, right? And, and so, uh, so at a certain point, I said, well, I gotta deal more directly with, the, with this interchange. And I, and I think you know, that, I, that, that became a very important part of the project. And I, and, and I think I found a way to do that. But it, it doesn't seem like in, in, in writing and criticism that, uh, you know, that the people who comment on the work have found a way of dealing with that. I think that's so true, and I think it's an opportunity to really enunciate that. You gave a wonderful talk um, at Hauser & Wirth when you opened your last show of the pecan trees of the southern trees, um, where you were really responding to that critique um, about your moving chains piece. You were talking about the piece uh, dealing with the Dred Scott um, case. But maybe a good segue to just talk about the systems and the trees, because the trees have also been this through line through your entire career that have run through. You consistently return to them since the 1970s and, and worked with uh, many different trees. And so maybe we should talk about um, the trees here just as a kind of an example and we can move on to the other works and continue to talk about that, I think, really important interplay um, that we want to make sure really gets um, heightened. So this is the most recent um, installment of the, the, the trees uh, where you uh, take uh, the, the image of a tree, a photograph of individual trees and you create a, you kind of take the analog form and translate it into a gridded matrix uh, that in, uh, is a numerical matrix. And then you transcribe and plot um, each tree in a different color. And as you move through the series, they layer one on top of the other. So we have the first one in the series here, a fossil, uh, which is an Arizona cottonwood. And as you move through this space, you actually move sequentially one through eight and so as each one then carries the legacy of the prior tree, leading up to then the 12, if you continue into the front space, you have uh, 9, 10, 11, and 12, and 12 uh, 
titled Sonoida, um, having the whole 12 layers uh, of the trees. So um, I know you want to talk about the process a bit of how um, you uh, begin the research process, but before we do that, maybe you could talk a little bit about why um, Arizona and the Arizona cottonwood. You've worked with, uh, first of all, the walnut trees was the first set of trees that you worked with, you created 27, 26, I think, different um, triptychs um, out of that through the years, between, from the late 70s to, to I think 2014. Uh, you've worked with palm trees, has been a very recurrent um, uh, tree that you've worked with, and pecan trees and other kinds of trees, but what led you to the cottonwood um, and to Arizona specifically as your next subject? Well, the, the, this, this project was started because there was an interest in commissioning me to do a, uh, uh, a, grid, uh, a, a grid piece, <clears throat> a, a grid tree piece, the plexi, one of the plexi pieces. And, uh, and I had mentioned to the people who are interested in the commission that I don't, I don't do individual pieces uh, and that uh, they have to exist as part of a, of a series and the series has to exist in the world. Uh, but then uh, the idea developed, with, I'm sure you had a lot to do with it, to uh, bring my work into the, into the museum and then it became uh, logical that as part of that project, that that series could be produced as a, as a museum exhibition. And the people who made the commission were, were totally delighted about, about this for some reason. You know, they, <laughs> uh, so th th that's what the commission, now the, they were interested uh, that uh, there would be a site specificity to the subject that I, that I chose. I mean, they, they knew that it was going to be a grid work with trees. And, but the way we come up with the uh, s subject, or the way we come up with the particular tree in that series, has to, more to do with the mechanics of making the photographs. That is, that the mechanics of, ha of getting photographs of, a tree image, of trees uh, that can be gridded. And in most cases, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, trees exist within a complex visual environment of, with other trees, and it's hard to isolate. So what, what, uh, one tree from the, from the forest, and, and, and one, so one requirement is that we're able to isolate the tree. The easiest trees to isolate, which I found out later was for, for reasons that are pretty grim, but the easiest trees to isolate photographically were, were the cottonwoods. So that was the motivation uh, for choosing that. The people who commissioned were, uh, said, well, why can't you do something that's native to, to uh, Arizona or Phoenix? Because cottonwoods are all over the, 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 the west, the north, you know, Utah all the way down through uh, Arizona. And, uh, and, and, and so they were a little dismayed that I was choosing the, the cottonwood, but I, there, there, it was the, really, I mean, it only under, uh, underscores uh, the importance of the strategy of making, you know, that that determines the, the, the object. And, uh, but they were pretty happy with it. They, they, said, they just made this, you know, modest co complaint, but said, okay, that's all right. <laughs> And uh, so, so what we do is that we take a trip, uh, and we, uh, well, I mean, the way we found out that the cotton was the best tree is because we, you know, we, did, we do this reconnaissance trip with, with the photographer and my assistants to, to check out the environment to see what's u uh, useful and usable, and we discovered the cotton was the best. And so we started uh, then photographing, I don't know, maybe 80 trees in the, uh, in, in the area. And out of that, I, that we chose actually 12 um, because the, we were actually thinking at a certain point that we would uh, do this series. And the, uh, but the Arizona show is being made up of, of, of eight, from what I understand. And, but we chose uh, 12 photographs out of the group. Um, and, uh, and the strategy of making, of, of course, is that we convert the photograph into a gridded uh, uh, image of the same tree, uh, create 
an individual uh, watercolor uh, by plotting the shape of the tree with watercolor paint and underscoring those areas of the shape of the tree, under, underscoring their location with numbers. Uh, the, people think that, you know, that there's a mysterious algorithm that goes on in the, on the numbers that I use, but it's actually quite simple. We predetermine the, the numerical location of each grid in, uh, in, in the, uh, each cell of the grid. And that location is simply in the center of the grid is zero. And those numbers progress from center to left, from which is to one to whatever number on the far left, 60. And from center to right, which would be you know the right center to 60, and then when you put the shape of the tree on top of that, uh, where the tree overlaps the grid, we fill in the number that's pre-assigned, and so it's not a mysterious algorithm that if you unpack, you would win the Nobel Prize. Uh, it's it's not, not, nothing like that. The system allows, therefore, uh, a painting of the tree. Uh, that in itself is, is produced by the system. That the, the, the formal or visual effects that you see are not a product of my imagination or my interest or intention. They are simply painting by numbers. However, the, the resultant object, it, it seems, nevertheless, has the same kind of meaningfulness to people that they would have if I had painted what I imagined. And, my, and this was important to me that people might recognize that. It's, it's partly because it's important to realize that the pieces were made systematically. It's, uh, it, it's my uh, interest to, uh, to make the point that our aesthetic response to objects, uh, that response that we think is something somehow natural, that that response is actually constructed. It's the way we've learned to see things. Like, like to, for example, to look at the grid of trees, uh, uh, the gridded image of trees, and see a tree uh, image is really a product of looking and seeing that kind of thing. Right? So, so the, what, what, uh, rather than, um, uh, let, let's say, uh, that, th that this is an image of a tree. It's actually an, an image of a collection of numbers and colors, but uh, uh, they aggregate to, to look like a tree. In the same way that black and white dots on a photograph aggregate to look like an image of a, of, a, of, of a tree. So the mystery then is how does one convert to the other? And what I'm saying that a conversion is a product of our learning. And so the, the individuality, or the individual, the, the differences of the trees become visible because you create this indeterminate space that allows you to kind of mine and, and have those possibilities where, as you, like, as you say, where you can have a discourse where you can bring different perspectives, positions to it and not necessarily your perspective. And we talked about how with the choice of cottonwood, as you can imagine in Arizona, the bland of saguaros and cactuses and um, succulents, that the cottonwood tree is a deciduous tree, um, but it has, it carries all these meanings, particularly in Arizona, because it's an indicator of water. It tends to follow um, riverbeds and creeks and um, uh, indicates the aquifer that's, that's present there. And so in the middle of the desert, when you see a cottonwood tree, you have this relief um, that there's water there, that there's animal life there, that you can take refuge there. And the uh, entity that commissioned you is the Barrow, Barrow Neurological Institute, which is um, one of the foremost research, uh, uh, brain injury and, um, and brain research center. And so you can imagine that you walk into this um, hospital and you see a cottonwood tree that people have a familiarity with, because it is all over the country. It's a, it's a resilient tree, but in Arizona, it gives you um, this incredible sort of sense of hope um, and it has all these other medicinal components um, and uses and has a strong history within um, indigenous communities as well as a space of connecting the spiritual realm to the earthly realm and um, to being the generator of the stars or all these associations and meanings and those weren't meanings really that you um, were necessarily looking for but you, when you, you say you often pick the location 
is important because you know that there are all, there are all these histories and subjectivities that people bring and carry to when they see objects like this. So for me living in Arizona, I can read and see all these things. Yeah, this is, this, that's very important that uh, I, I learned quite early that uh, such specificity in terms of section of, 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 of the trees and the, and the site was very important because uh, people read and identify that object in, in, in various ways that are specific to that location or even beyond that location. But in, in any case, there is a narrative that's associated with each, tr each object that I choose that's informed by its location. Normally, um, you would think that, for example, the kinds of symbolisms and, and so forth that you described, uh, talked about, normally we think that uh, if that is part of the reading of the work, then it has to be part of the intention of the artist to make that part of the reading of the work. And the reason why we think that is because we believe uh, uh, that it becomes the poetic basis that comes from our subjectivity uh, for the experience of, 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 of the work and the object. So, and I, so I say that the, our, our general notion of subjectivity, I, uh, the, the work is in conflict with, that, that, that I believe that there's an, uh, an idea of, this, of, the, of, a, of the subject and the idea of subjectivity, but I don't believe that the way we read it in art is, is uh, not only useful, but is problematic because it introduces a lot of strategies of identity and identification that feeds into racist discourse. So, uh, so if you believe that these narratives grow out of the poetic intentions of the artist that somehow mysteriously connects with its, the environment, then you believe that that connection is natural. And my whole, th point is that it's not natural, it's constructed, it's a product of our learning. So in this case, I knew nothing about this, these ideas about the use of cottonwoods. <laughs> and uh, as we worked on the series, and I learned even more today as we were talking earlier about the significant narratives come out of location, my feeling is that with all of those readings and all of that it become as important in determining the meaningfulness of the work uh, as, as anything else, as the system that I use to, to, to realize the work. And some people might say that, well, how could it be? Because you didn't even know that. But I didn't even, even know what these things would look like before I started making them. And so the, these, uh, these relationships, these meanings, these narratives come out of the, as a product of the arbitrary and, and random and the indeterminate basis of, the, of using systems to produce work. And those meanings are, are, are fueled by that arbitrariness. And for me, it's, it's quite specifically specific to the work, even though I had no idea about them. When you've talked about how the system paints the tree, right, which gives you the agency to be as much spectator in the process, right? And you've said that if art remains only in the imagination of the artist, it's not accessible to other and all audiences. It remains exclusionary, to kind of understand, underscore your point, that this personalization or this self-referentiality -refer um, protects it from political or social critique. And what you're trying to do is open up that political and social critique and that you can participate in that discourse, that it could be relevant over time. So all those meanings I bring to it, or others bring to it, are um, as valid and open as what, and you can participate in what you bring to it without it being predetermined that it's your hand that, that created that. Uh, did I say that that I think way? you said that. You said that's, that. You said it better than me. That's, 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 that's sometimes that's you have to hear it several eloquent. times I mean, for it to, to, you know. <laughs> She's made it more eloquent, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's very important uh, that that uh, that I be, that I find myself as a, as a viewer or a spectator, like uh, like uh, everyone else. Now, it's it's important to point out though that 
I don't, you know, you know it, as a teacher, what happens, I find out in students is that they'll make an image, make a work and, and create an image and tell me what the image means. And I ask them, you know, you know, uh, what, you know, how am I supposed to get to that meaning? You know, like, this is, uh, you know, this is my father's shoe, and it's important as my father's shoe. And, 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 uh, and, and, I, and I'd say that, well, this gives me no access to why that's important to you. So I say that, and in, 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 in which case I say that, you know, that my personal interpretation doesn't link, link up to your intentions and your personal interpretation. And I criticize students. I kick them out of the classroom. Don't come back ever. And, <laughs> Uh, but it's important to, to say that that uh, particular subjective interpretation, in the, of course, in the case of my work, is different. You know, <laughs> that, that that particular uh, subject this, uh, interpretation operates within a, a, the, the framework of a randomizing system. So it's just not me something that I'm uh, uh, an interpretation that I'm just placing and and say that anybody else can have any interpretation that they want. That's a, a different strategy based upon a, a basic idea uh, that, uh, you know, this, this notion that a work of art cannot be constrained by any kind of discursive or narrative uh, uh, framework. And, and that, that, that I don't believe in. I believe that works of art are constrained discursively and narratively. Uh, but it, in my case, you know, it, I, it's open to these, to the introduction of of all these different contents because they're, they're produced by that randomizing system. I think that's maybe a good segue, yeah, to talk about um, that. But I wanted to actually maybe just hit on, I think, well, a couple of things. When you think about the different tree series that you've done, you know, that the kind of critique that, that you get that they're, they're formal and they're abstract works and they're not really dealing with political content. If you go back to the, um, you know, to the palm trees, you were very much selected them for the reason that they were planted. You know, they're a foreign tree to the area, and that um, migrant workers uh, tend to them and harvest them. And there's there's a reason that they're there, and a, a political reason why they're there. In the same way that the pecan trees, the southern trees, were planted after the end of slavery and um, to start a different economy. Like there's political histories there, and whether it was intended or not, you know, with the with the Arizona trees too, with the challenges of water uh, in Arizona and the fact that you're seeing isolated, I talked to an arborist at the Desert Botanic Garden the, the other day, um, the fact that you're seeing single trees or finding them is an indicator that the environment isn't well, right? That the trees need water, they, they, um, their roots don't travel very deep and if you're finding singular trees, they tend to cluster in groves that the cottonwoods have an uncertain future. Um, and they're a key, one of these keystone species that um, really all kinds of animal life and plant life, everything kind of hinges um, on it. So they are healthy old trees uh, in these areas, but there is a sort of darker uh, future that it's portending, um, which again, you didn't know or intended, but again, you selected trees that you know there's cultural histories and, and stories there that you're, you're un, uh, bringing forward or you know they'll come forward, right? If you give them, if you let, allow us to see them, right? You, let, you give us a way to visibilize them through the system, systematic analysis that you do. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, it's, I've, I've gotten to understand that uh, there is uh, a complex narrative around objects that are from particular sites and, and, uh, and the, the, probably the way Probably, if the, if in the area of intentions, because there are, there are all kinds of, of uh, there are many ways that, uh, or many decisions that I make in making this work that many are, are, are intentional. Uh, I, I don't call them subjective decisions, but they nevertheless are intentional. And one is that I learned that if you really focus on the side, then you, you encourage the introduction to, of the complex narratives and their relationship to the object. And you mentioned the cottonwood trees and you, uh, that uh, the, the complex narrative around that that I had no idea about until you talked about it today. But I knew that uh, you know, people from the region would know about it. And, and, and all I have to do is listen to them and that would increase my you know, content understanding of even what I did. 
the pecan trees in Charleston. Uh, this extraordinary story having to do with the history of racism, why those trees are, th are there, and, and even why they're disappearing they're there. Uh, and uh, th that, uh, a lot of that narrative I knew about, but there are aspects of the narrative I didn't know about. I think the work gave me the opportunity, gave, uh, gave the opportunity for, for me and I hope for others to, to en enrich your understanding of the, of the social and cultural narratives around those objects. Uh, you know, one of them uh, being uh, as, uh, uh, that the, uh, the, the pecan tree was a substitute for cotton because they needed, after the end of the Civil War, they needed a crop that didn't require as much work as cotton because they didn't have free labor anymore. You know? And uh, so that's part of that, the political in, uh, narrative that's applied to that can be applied to the grid work, the, the work that people find hard to read politically. But it's through these narratives that you're able to access those political, those political uh, narratives. And uh, the same with the palm trees. The, the, um, the, the site around uh, um, uh, 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 Palm Springs. Yeah, there, there's an area called uh, Palm Canyon that's below Palm Springs. That's a site of a Native American, several Native American uh, populations, and the, the, and the trees that we photographed there were on a, on, a, on Native American land, and on that, that, and uh, so in that particular instance, it's the only it's the only natural palm trees in California. Like, like all, any, all the other palm trees in California were imported from other parts of the world. But the palm trees that you find around uh, Palm Springs, and those are only native trees to the region. And to me, that is a metaphor, of, not of my creation, of what happened to the Native American population in, in, in that region. That is that they survive only because those, I mean, earlier they survived because they were property of the Native Americans, uh, you know, now they've become like, you know, like uh, used to, you know, to decorate and, and so forth. But, they, but their survivability uh, really existed there. And that's, a, you know, a content that's not difficult to access once you start thinking about the site where these trees uh, exist. And so that's the only intentional thing I do now that I did less of that my son was complaining about, <laughs> that, that, that I uh, be, became this, uh, more focused around this, the, uh, in, in these works, which tend to be quite abstract, the site or the location of the, of the, of the uh, plants. Yeah, and if you walk around and look at the, the subtitles on these, you'll see place names in some cases or colors in some cases, but that refer to you places along certain rivers, Gila River, Hacienda River, um, Sinoida um, is in, near Tucson. Um, some of these are actually on indigenous land as well, on, on reservations. But I think maybe what you're saying is a good maybe segue to talk about maybe the language space works because the associations, you know, as the work moves in the world into different locations, it provokes, the context also provokes certain associations and readings, but in your language base works, it is all about putting two things that are unrelated together to provoke these associations, and it, you're often starting with political content first. So I don't know if you want to talk about the first in the series, Night Crimes, or other pieces, or more recent works like Moving Chains. Yeah, the the um, the way I invoke uh, a systematic uh, strategy in the language pieces is, is precisely as you say by bringing two or more things together that are completely unrelated. And the uh, relationship is drawn between these two different things in the, man in, in the strategy of presentation. Uh, for example, in the Manifesto series, um, I, I bring together uh, politi political texts. Uh, earlier there were true manifestos, but now I've gotten to deal with any political text and present them in relationship to um, music the, the the way the music there's a relationship there because the way the music is real is realized is by converting the, the, the letters of the text into musical notes and then 
or taking those those notes and making a, an, a, a, an arrangement for to be performed, uh, so that when you're reading the text, you hear the music. Uh, and now the meaning, the meaning, it seems intentional. It, it starts to come together between the music that you hear and the text that you read. But at the same time, in other, in other words, uh, in the earliest pieces, uh, people s said that those, you know, that that this, the music seemed to draw out this, this you know, sadness. You know, I mean, in, in other words, they, it, it introduced an emotion that didn't exist in the text itself because of the, uh, of, the, of, the of hearing and, and seeing at the same time. And uh, uh, so the, the, the way the text is introduced and the, and the music, that, that manner of combining them is, is arbitrary because t just taking the, the notes, the letters of, of words and converting the notes and sequencing them according to the way they fall in, in, a, in a text creates a sound that has nothing to do with the content of the word. But inevitably, you, you pull them together. Now, the, the uh, so, you know, I mean, I should say for a moment that that's where one of the instances where people think I, that I, you know, that I, not, not a liar, but at least a fabricator. Because they can't believe that that, that I didn't intend that, that uh, emotion content relationship, that I didn't intend that to happen. Uh, but I say that, how can I intend it if I put it together in a way and I prove it because the drawings, I make drawings out of the music and you can see how each letter is turned into a note. And so, so how can I intend it if I uh, you know, rigorously attach myself to the system? The, uh, the reason they become together is because I'm taking the syntactical level of language and the semantic, and combining it with music theory. You know, I'm not. I'm, I'm just doing it with the mathematics of music, and what, what you might say is the the probably mathematics of language, where all of this networking and crossover can happen. What produced by the, the interlinking of these two things is unpredictable and, and way out beyond uh, my ability to imagine. And, uh, and, and so for me, the, the reason that they're meaningful is because uh, we have learned a certain way to link up, you know, there's a certain me me metonymic and metaphor structures that go into play in our perception and understanding of the world that we're just applying to these pieces. And, and when, and most of the time you're told, oh, that's part of subjectivity. But what I'm saying is, in this case, and say, well, it's obviously not a product of subjectivity, it's a product of our learning because you already have the, the, the connecting mechanisms in your cognitive apparatus to make these things meaningful. In other, in other words, it's harder to, to, to let things exist in, in, a, in a relationship of arbitrariness than to make them exist in a relationship of meaning. It's, it's really much harder. It seems like it would be the other way around, but it's, it's not. And uh, uh, so in, in that way, I'm using the syntactics of language and music theory in the way that I use numbers and grids in the tree pieces to draw in uh, this, the moment where it, then the third element of this is where you, you know, find what you're looking at meaningful. Because, the, because then it's when it's found meaningful is when I can step in and say that here's my critique of this project of universal, universality, the project of the, the subject, the, the, the determining nature that we think of subjectivity and establishing meaningfulness. This, here's where I, I step in. Uh, 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 you know, in, in my lecture tomorrow, I'll tell you my theory of subjectivity. <laughs> but I think that the, you said that people sometimes resist, they don't believe that you didn't um, plan it that way, right? That, that's, that's also, you're talking about the power of ide ideology, right? The power of, of these ideas that kind of, that it's 
there is this um, kind of universal truth uh, to things, and that's what you're trying to dismantle, right, and challenge. It. It's a critique of representation and perceptions of um, how, we, how we perceive. And for you, this is part of, I, think, I know, a larger kind of way you're contributing to the larger decolonial project. Right? Do you want to talk a little bit about how you see, it, see yourself within that in this moment? Oh, yeah, I, I'm happy to. The, the, uh, the first systems work produced in the early 70s, and, and, the, uh, and it wasn't a very good time in the art world for uh, minority artists and women. Uh, and uh, it's a great time for white men, but it is what it is, right? So the uh, uh, so when I started doing the systems-based work, I got trouble from both ends. One is from uh, a white artist who said that you know, I mean, this this uh, work, you know, how, how could you be making this work? Because you know, it doesn't. Uh, I couldn't predict that this is something that you would be making. Uh, or that this work has nothing to do with your lived experience and, and uh, race. Uh, and on the same basis, you know, uh, artists, that friends who are from the, the black, black power movement, so it was, it told me I was making white art. So I, I thought that, well, you know, I can't dismiss either of those. I mean, there must be something legitimate going on in this critique. And, and, and then something deep inside me thought, that I maybe I should figure this out because I never thought I was making white art, and and uh, so you know, 15 years and you know a few Umberto Eco books along with Edward Said. <laughs> later, uh, I, I, I realized or I came to the conclusion that the uh, my interest in was really to, un, in, in critiquing subjectivity, was really to unpack the idea, the enlightenment idea of universality. Uh, and then that came from my experience of, of living in the Jim Crow South as a, as a child, where um, the, 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 culture, the, the, the cultural rules around living in the South seemed to be arbitrary because it didn't make sense that I would be identified in the way that white people had identified me. It just didn't make sense. So, uh, uh, so it created for me a surreal, a, 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 a lived experience of surreality. And, uh, and that uh, caused, I think that was responsible for me to look at systems. All right, and in that way, you know, I, I thought that quite early on, I was involved in the decolonized, decolonization project. Uh, well, you know, the, the idea of the decolonization project didn't exist in the 70s, but, uh, uh, but by the, the 80s and the early 90s, discourse was, was more concretely written around that, and I was able to say, well, yeah, I can go back and say that the, the difference between, let's say, Saul LeWitt, who was, who was one of my great friends and, and who's really responsible for uh, the, 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 my career to get kicked off. Uh, the difference between Saul and, and myself is that he was not interested in the issues of representation because he wasn't interested in attacking this aspect, what we call the decolonization subject, uh, project, where universal ideas are, have been employed to create hierarchies and structures that privilege white people. And so I, I wanted to take that apart, and I saw that, well, subjectivity was one of the, the misuse of subjectivity is one of the, uh, the, the problems uh, the, the, that uh, uh, keeps this playing field so unequal. And art was one of the worst contributors to that problem, particularly at, in the 70s when I was one, when um, uh, the, the idea uh, uh, of any representational manifestation was, was troublesome, let alone you know, things that dealt with specific cultural issues and, and interests. And I, I saw that as that was the real reason why women and minorities were being left out, because you know, therefore the, the normalcy, which is universalism, was really men, so, so, so and white men. 
and that uh, marginality was women and people of color. And, and that was not normal. That was outside the range of norm normality. Uh, so I said, this concept of, of the normal is really the problem. It's really the thing. And the, and the concept of the normal that we lived under, uh, uh, that we live under as Western people, um, was a product of the Enlightenment project. So that's why I, I, I see the politics in, in these works uh, as, as part of that uh, uh, investment in the decolonization project. Thank you for really underscoring that political domain that your entire work encompasses. Um, but maybe before we open to questions, I, I wanted from the audience, I just wanted to ask you too, that it seems that for you also, working with the trees continues to be this very fertile space for you as you do other projects and other series and go between these two different systems that you work, that it seems to be the, the, tr the through line that's grounding for you um, that's always, as you said, it's always giving you surprises and learnings. Can you talk about the importance of why it is, or what do, what do you surmise it's so important for you? Yeah, when we were talking earlier, I told you that, you know, that I was, con you know, the, the, the tree as a, as a subject and, and, the, and the grid work, it just was irrepressible, it just wouldn't go away. So, uh, and because, you know, I thought that there would be a point where it would exhaust itself. In fact, you know, Roxana, my wife, told me, what, you got to make another tree piece? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's true. I mean, if I got the idea that uh, I was repeating stuff, you know, I'd like to think I would stop. But it, but it actually it permutates into new avenues. And, and the most recent was my show at Hauser in New York. Uh, that, that work, uh, it's a simple reversal happened where I put the, the photograph on the, 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 uh, on the uh, plexi panel in the front and the grid in the back. That simple um, gesture when, I, when we made the uh, uh, samples of the object, it, I, it took me quite a while to get used to what I was looking at. I, I, I thought that my career was over, actually. <laughs> you know. You know, or maybe this is that she was right. I've finally gone too far with these trees. <laughs> but but after a while, and this is usually the way it happens because you live with work for a while, and and, uh, and then it uh, you know it, it, it starts revealing stuff. It's, it, it started uh, revealing things that had never happened in any of the other works on the plexi and trees before. And as long as that stuff happens, you know. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think that it's okay to, to keep working on the tree image. Uh, and, but then, uh, of course, you know, I've, I've used other images. The whole time that I've worked, worked with the grid, I've used all sorts of uh, uh, images, the grid, like uh, the Trisha Brown series. I tried to uh, grid out the idea of movement in space and, and then shadows. Uh, you know, I, I tried to uh, grid out this the displacement manifestation between an object and its shadow. And, uh, and then faces, of course, where the, the, the work that where I initially discovered uh, how important the political read of an image is. Uh, uh, so I, I continue to, uh, to, uh, to do that. But in between these excursions, I, always go, I seem to always go back to the tree. I know you're, um, you finished this, this is uh, series two, but you're still working on series one, which is what we're showing at the Phoenix Art Museum. You're, I think, on the third one now, or if just finished two. Are, are, have any surprises revealed themselves so far as you're working on making series one? Oh, yeah. I mean, they, 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 you know, they, I've done, uh, in terms of large plexi, plexi works with deciduous trees. I've done a, a, like three st different series on that, and this looks like none of the other two. And the, the it, it, and that's a part of it has to do with it's the shape of the tree and, and, and how they contribute to this, what happens in the sequencing of overlapping. Uh, but these are, uh, and, and, and maybe the color, that I, the color, that I, I mean, we, we select colors for trees arbitrarily. There's no, um, it's not a, really a system, it's just 
It's just that you use colors that you didn't use before, and then you use some colors that are distinguishable, because I wanted to, to be able to uh, read the history of the, of the sequencing of individual trees. Uh, but for some reason, these colors have turned out unlike any other uh, set of colors that, that I've used before. They're, they're very, uh, I don't want to call it, it's, I don't want to call it grim, but a, a very, they're, they're not uh, uh, airy and fanciful. Uh, like I uh, identified with the, the um, I think, uh, a, a series I, I, I did uh, about seven years ago uh, where the, 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 the colors, you know, were more airy and fanciful and, and, and that, that happened. But this one is, they're, they're very, they're darker and they reveal the skeletal structure of the, of the tree more, even as you layer them, there is a greater reveal of the skeleton, what I call it, the skeletal structure. So some different things are happening, and I can never explain why. Mm -hmm. And the photo is on top or in front? In this well, case? The photo is behind. It's behind. Yes, the photo's in the back, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I understand you're already thinking about a different tree, that you may be going to Africa? Yeah, we're uh, working uh, on a new series for a show in uh, L.A. Uh, Hauser and, and West Hollywood in 2025. Uh, I'll only be 39 years old when we did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we're going to, there to do a photo shoot in Tanzania. And we're, we're, there are three species of trees that we're shooting there, and, and uh, we're going to three, three national parks, one the Serengeti, to shoot uh, the three species. The, the, main, the, one, the species, though, I'm, I'm thinking about for the show is the, is the baobab tree, uh, which is another tree that's in crisis in, in Africa. Uh, but they are, um, I've, ne I've never been to Africa, and I've never seen these trees live, but people who have said that they're life-changing. Yes. See? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and so, so you've outlined a couple of things just before we open it to questions that, that are coming up. So um, obviously the Arizona trees in November of 2024 at the Phoenix Art Museum and then November, actually November of this year, your show at ICA Miami opens in Miami and then it will come to Phoenix. You have this project in 2025, but also next summer is the continuation of the project with um, the Times Square and Creative Time Project, the American Manifest, and Moving Chains will go to Cincinnati, no? Uh, yes, if I had mentioned this, uh, uh, Justine and Jean would like shoot me. Like, they don't care, they wouldn't care if the cops would come and arrest them, they would just shoot me. <laughs> so, so the, you know, the, uh, um, the, the uh, Moving Chains, uh, and the Roots Project, the Roots that, that Jean Cooney curated in the Times Square Project, along with Manifestos Four, which is the, is the performance um, of the Dred Scott decision. That, along with Moving Chains, which is the big uh, what do you call it, sculpture, uh, uh, Cincinnati, in, um, it will open sometime in March, April. It's um, cited, the, the roots is over in Times Square, it's not there anymore, but moving chains will be in, time, in on Governor's Island until the middle of October. Uh, and uh, right now, it is a, um, it, we're, it's open to be, uh, so that you can go see the object, but it's not running uh, because we, have to make some very important mechanical changes to the object. But then in, a, in about a month, it will be running again. Uh, so, so and you have, if you have, uh, if you desire to go see it, you have all the way till October to do that. Is there anything else you want to add or comment on before we open it up to the audience? Uh, the only thing I want to say is that how you know, thrilled and grateful I am that you've done this interview. I, I'm oh. a real, real fan. Oh. It's an honor for me, so thank you. 
Any questions that, oh good, we have lots of hands. Let's start with you. Hi. Maybe uh, talk about how the public art, no. how does the public art um, respond to or run parallel to the more systemic, systematic work that you've been talking about today? Um, especially in terms of how you want people to approach it or to try to understand it. And you know, what are the parallels that you see? Uh, I, I've done, uh, well, the public, the, the, making public art is something brand new. Um, uh, moving chains is really the, the first um, attempt at making such a major public work. And I have no idea how that happened, uh, you know, be, uh, because the Creative Times asked me to make a proposal for the, the, a, a, of a public work for um, uh, the original site of, of, of the project. And I have no idea why they asked me, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing in the history of my work that would suggest that I would be the person to ask to do this. But I'm so thrilled that they did because uh, it was an opportunity, and I didn't know this, that to continue another project that I'd been involved in the whole time, which were making these machines. And uh, so I just uh, continued to think of this public work as the opportunity to build another machine. And uh, it, uh, in relationship to some of the conceptual and strategies that are used in the other work, in the public work, it's really repetition. And so it's, it's a time-based grid in which things happen. And uh, uh, so repetition and recurrence uh, uh, is, 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 is that product that I think intensifies the experience of the machine. The machines, uh, the machines seem to, uh, uh, they, they deal with movement, of course, but they deal with sound. And the, uh, and the, the relationship of sound to the object, to how, this is one where the sound helps to identify meaning in the object, but it also provides, just like in the Manifesto series, provides, uh, it's, uh, it, it draws from the viewer an emotional re response. And I guess those are the major things that I think are parallel. Charles, I wonder maybe if it would be helpful to talk about Falling Rock as one of these early, earlier machines in this context, and it's, it's a piece along with Greenhouse that will be in the show, the ICA Miami show, that will give viewers an opportunity to see that. But I think that is an important connection to draw. Yes, well, Falling Rock is, uh, is a tower which will be four, um, 12 feet high. You know, at the top of it is, is a 60-pound uh, a piece of granite that's attached to a cable, and uh, and then there's there's some there's a clock up there and some gears and machinery at the top, and every ten minutes the uh, the rock falls the 12 feet to the bottom of the tower, where there's sheets of glass located, and and, the, and but the, the the rock stops within centimeters of striking the glass, so the glass you know sits there and, and rattles for a while. But uh, it's, it's structured or programmed so that at random moments the, the rock crashes through the, gra the glass and makes this uh, incredible sound. It's a very violent piece, you know, and I never thought of myself as a violent person. Uh, but again, it, it deals with repetition, but it deals with the idea of chance and randomness because you don't know when that event's going to happen. Uh, yeah. Donna. There's a lot of conversation in the 60s period about systems, of course, and you've talked about, you know, you've mentioned someone like LeWitt, and, and I've always seen, you know, in your work this idea, and maybe that you've already talked about this, maybe I'm just applying a different word, which is, of course, systems are always, we see them as rational and objective, um, but of course, what you've revealed is that they're not, and do you think that you're subverting the system in that way? I, 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 I think that uh, I'm trying to disconnect. See, the, the system's always uh, part of, of a mechanics that's desired, that produces uh, a, a, 
Systems are always part of a mechanic that uh, that uh, is uh, is that that's intended to produce a, a comprehensible of, a result. You know, and uh, so what I'm trying to do is is break that relationship. You know, the purpose, the system, and its purpose. And in that way, I think that I'd rather see them as fundamentally irrational brought into reason by our social and public discourse. Thank you, everybody. Question about your students. I'm curious, do they understand your work? Do they hear you, they learn from you, they're listening to you? Do they understand your work? <laughs> I, I, I don't, I think that they understand it as much as anybody else does. <laughs> but what's always interesting to me is that uh, I don't have any student who works like me. Yeah, and I've had a lot of students, you know. So, so but nobody makes, uh, lucky for them, you know, <laughs> uh, work like me. And, and so it draws the question, you know, well, why would they not only take my, my uh, coursework, but why would they stay? You know, and, and, they, and they do. Even Henry Taylor came back every week. And, and, uh, and Henry, I love Henry, but our work is are nothing alike, and his worldview is not anywhere near mine. But somehow, the, the, there uh, is something that's interesting and provocative. And uh, I, I, I like to th think that they're just curious about the, you know, the way I think through things, and it, 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 which really can be seen apart from one's you know, you know, aesthetic preferences or style and so forth. You know, a, a kind of intellectual rigor. Uh, and I'm not trying to pra praise myself, but I'm just saying that uh, it's, uh, I'm naturally intellectually curious and, and, and I like to apply that to works of art. So, but I also apply that in my teaching. And, uh, and in their own way, I like to think that in their own way, they think that there's a way of uh, applying a kind of rigor to their own practice, but framed in a way that's meaningful to them. It's a good question, yeah. There. Uh, the arts on the east end of Long Island? I, I'm, I'm, I don't know what that means, I'm sorry. Like, when you think of, when you think of art, the art history that has happened on the east end of Long Island, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Or what's something that, that, like, that is instigated by that thought? I mean, I, I knew that a lot of New York artists used to come to this part, and that's about it, you know? <laughs> I mean, what's interesting to me about this, this, this part, because I, I was, uh, when, when, I, when I was graduating from undergraduate school, I, I worked there for two summers in Sag Harbor. And, and uh, actually, uh, uh, a camp, I, 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 was a, I was a counselor uh, for this camp for underprivileged kids. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I learned how to sail, well, I should say, I learned how to save myself from drowning. <laughs> Doing that as a kid race from Newark, that was something that's, yeah, you know, something that's new. And, uh, and so, so these many years later, you know, I find myself back here. And, and in the interim, I learned that there was a very important uh, black community that lived in this region that uh, for, for various reasons, was uh, you, you know displaced, and uh, uh, so I, have, I, I so I'm I, I always thinking that there there are, and I've seen a couple of things that there are remnants or tropes of that community that I'm, and so if you ask me about art, that's about the closest that I can come to, other than you know like New York artists moving here to, in the summer. Uh, I was sorry. I was I missed the first part, but um, 
in terms of the these systems and you and how you map them onto each tree, like for, at a fair distance, there the colors and repetitions seem as though they're related, but each tree has its own like context and like uh, mythology. And so how how are you? And you spoke to I'm, I'm just to the to get into the brass tacks. It's like can you speak more about the color theory and the math, how math is kind of integrated? Because the because looking closely, like they're they're numbered, but the numbers don't correspond to the colors. And so like what so each tree is its own like mathematical equation. And how do you map color back onto that equation? Yeah, I, I, I did mention it earlier, but but uh, I can briefly say that uh, the numbers and the colors have a com completely utilitarian purpose, uh, and and that is that they're there to record the shape of the tree, and help implement the transfer of its shape from drawing or from painting to painting, which is necessary to build up the, se the sequence. So it's it's it's, uh, it's loosely called math, but it's really uh, a kind of mapping, uh, where um, I assign to the grid. Uh, a, num uh, a number which serves uh, the purpose of locating that point in the grid in space. You know? so, so in the middle you see zero and then it, the numbers grow, uh, progress from center to left and progress again from center to right. And then when I project the shape of a tree in there, I fill in the, uh, the number, the designated number, wherever the tree shape falls on the grid. And the, so that creates the aggregate image of a tree, all, all these numbers together. Then I, then I paint them. Uh, and and the, the reason that I paint them is, is to be able to more clearly identify the differences between the different trees in the, in the grid. That there's no um, uh, meaning that's applied to my use of color. It's, it's just filing. Uh, and that's not to say that there aren't meanings, because most of the stuff I was talking about how meanings become important in the work. But, that, but the, what, what you see in that respect is, is simply instrumental. Uh, the one other thing is that, that with, the, with, the, with the issue of meaning, uh, it's not that each tree has a, a very diff, uh, specific history. It's the, uh, the relationship with the aggregate of trees to the site. That, Yeah, there, it, uh, again, uh, there are rules that, that are attributed to its making. So, uh, so for example, the, uh, uh, you see variations in, in color and in intensity uh, because uh, the rule is that you, you fill seven squares, charge the brush, fill seven squares, then charge the brush again and fill seven squares. And so as you fill the squares, it's going to get lighter and lighter. And, uh, and, and the... Uh, so what's the other part? The, the, oh, yeah, well, yeah, I was saying that the, the, the colors from, we have a library of thousands and thousands of colors. And I, the selection of colors for trees is really dependent upon whether that color can uh, help des designate the tree in the system. In other words, I want you to be able to, to see the difference between the trees. So even if you see eight trees, I want you to be able to see the record of all eight trees. And the, no. You're, you're just, you're just it's, it's just arbitrarily painted, you know, according to that rule. But then the randomness happens when a layer comes on top of another layer and the colors surprise you, right? Because they blend. Yeah, so the things that seem, you know, like it's designed happen, but I'm trying to say that it's not. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a product of, uh, of the random system of its application. So I'm not saying that it's devoid of meaning. I'm saying that meaning is acquired in these pieces in a way that's different from, you know, the, uh, what's normally ex uh, expe expected. One more question? Okay. Okay. I'm just curious. A second. How long does it take to, uh, to produce one piece? Uh, to produce like the show? <laughs> No, when you 
start working on each piece. Sorry, I'm terrible. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, it's, I, I have a, a team that makes them, you know, and, and, uh, and so for, uh, we have 14 people who, who work on the pieces, and a show like this, this show t took, uh, like, I think, seven months, and uh, normally it takes a year. The, the plexi pieces can take up to a year, yeah, and it's because it's so detailed, and, 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 and in the early days, of course, I had no more than one or two people working with me, and I don't know how those works got made. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Charles. Thank you, Russell, Mark, Utah, Natalie, the team here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for.